since the 1950s. You walk down an alley not even two meters across and emerge to find gift shops and pubs and even more winding streets. You zig and zag down this street and that, marveling at the gorgeous architecture. Old buildings mixed with a handful of new ones. Muted earth tones of stucco and concrete and rock are the neighborhood's palette. You wonder what the rest of the city looks like. You're excited to find out. You stroll through the narrow, glowing streets filled with locals on their way to work and other travelers like yourself. As you walk, the streets get wider and the people grow fewer and fewer. You see an old woman hang laundry out on a small balcony and a man enjoying coffee from his windowsill. It's mostly residential here. Your flat, you think, should be just a few blocks over. The people on the street are just getting started with their days. Some in a hurry, others not so much. You walk on the sunny side of the street, following the slow pace of the elderly couple in front of you. They walk hand in hand, spanning the width of the sidewalk. But you're not in any kind of rush. You listen to the dulcet chatter of the people ahead of you. The lilting cadence sounds like music to you. But you're starting to be able to pick out words here and there. You can tell simply by their tones that they've loved each other for a long time. It's almost surreal, the anachronistic qualities of the city blending together to create a unique work of art. More often than not, you spot a place where 1449 and 1959 are right next door to each other, but you can't imagine it any other way. You walk until you arrive, quite by accident, at a tall iron gate leading into the English cemetery. You follow the gravel path, moved by the stillness and beauty. The white stone monuments dating from almost 200 years ago are surrounded on all sides by immaculately groomed flowers. You take in the gentle scents, admiring the greens and oranges and lavenders juxtaposed against the weathered stone. The trail leads you up a gentle slope to a towering cross resting atop a tall marble column. You reflect for a moment, surrounded on all sides by Florence's rich culture and history wondering what it was like to live here way back then. You head back out onto the street and turn south, drawn as if by magic towards the Arno River, like the city wants you to go there. That is, after all, why you're here. To satisfy your wanderlust, the experience what a new part of the world has to offer, to do, and see everything you can. You've never taken a trip like this by yourself before, but it's already a liberating journey. You only walk for a few minutes before you reach the river, stopping in the center of the bridge to watch the water move beneath you. It's slow and lazy, just how you feel this morning. You're relaxed and ready to go with the flow. Blue dawn has come and gone, and the soft morning rays reflect upon the surface of the water, illuminating the ripples that form on the surface of this ancient river, whose breeze is lapping at your face, bringing you the brisk scent 
purple stream of the Tuscan region. But before the water was here flowing beneath you, it was born of the Monte Falterona in the Apennines, a mountain range consisting of smaller mountain ranges. For a moment, you close your eyes and picture yourself there. You smell the sweet and crisp alpine air, fresh like a ripe apple. Green hills roll down in all directions. You feel like you're on top of the world. The Apennines preserves ecosystems that have been lost in the rest of Europe. You look around at this lost paradise. Here you can find the Italian wolf and the Marsican brown bear, which are extinct everywhere else but this calming utopia. The mountainsides are made of sandstone and are covered in beech trees, and it is here from which the Arno springs, before it curves its way across the region to arrive here. To you, on this brisk morning, in Florence, Firenze. You cross the bridge and walk along the south bank of the river. Without thinking, you follow the Arno upstream back towards the center of the city. You stroll alongside the water, admiring the tranquil scenery in an almost meditative state. Beautiful gardens and trees and sculptures come and go as you walk and you feel the deep connection between nature and humanity. The city seems to grow older as you walk, like you're able to walk back in time, gradually stepping back a thousand years. You pass by an open air food market and the smell of citrus fills the air, quickly overtaken by the colors and rich aromas of a leather shop a few doors down. Before you know it, you are standing on the Ponte Vecchio, the oldest bridge in Florence. In fact, you hear a tour guide say the name simply means old bridge. You smile. It sounds much better in Italian, you think to yourself. It's a massive covered bridge supported underneath by stone arches and topped with a corridor with shops sandwiched in between, where vendors sell gold, jewelry, and watches. You're astounded by the engineering, which at the time must have seemed nothing short of miraculous. The craftsmanship poured into every detail catches your attention, and you admire the earth-colored stucco, tans, and ogres and grays, punctuated here and there, by forest green and burgundy shutters. Floods have come and gone. Over time, the Ponte Vecchio has been swept away time and time again, and then rebuilt time and time again. It's not built from the same stones, but somehow it's the same bridge. When the Ponte Vecchio was first built in Roman times, it would have been lined with shops. You would have walked down the busy bridge and caught the rich, earthy scent of leather at the tannery. Walked past busy butchers slicing their meat. Sampled fresh fruit and vegetables at the farmer's market. Cherries and apricots and dark purple plump figs. You can almost hear the sounds. The cackling and cries of busy life like a fire changing shape in the wind. Alive and vibrant, pulsing and changing with every minute. On this morning though, there are no butchers. They were banned by decree in 1593. This is because above the Ponte Vecchio, the Vasari Corridor, was built to allow monarchs to move freely between the Palazzo Pitti and the Palazzo Vecchio. To give 
Vasari's Corridor Prestige, butchers were banned from the bridge, and only jewelers and goldsmiths were allowed to operate. This means that today, as you amble across the bridge, your shoes hitting the stone, there are only storefronts and souvenir shops. But it's buzzing nonetheless, pulsing still. Around you, tourists walk past, making their way across the bridge for the first time. Hesitating at times, like you, blinded for brief moments by the flashes of sun hitting the gold and expensive gemstones in the shop windows. And then there are the more determined, the locals, making their way across. Steady, quick steps on the pavement. They walk with purpose and intention. If you walked faster, you could blend in with them, you think. You know where you're going now. Your gait is less purposeful than those who live here, but still with intention. On the other side of the river are the Museo Galileo, the Palazzo Vecchio, and the Museo Salvatore Ferragamo. You have the whole day ahead of you. You pause for a moment near a large sculpture, the bust of Cellini. It's crowded here, but you understand why. You breathe in this spot. The link between the two sides of the city. You're almost in the center of Florence, and you feel the tangible ties to antiquity all around you. You make your way through the other tourists and let your body hang over the side of the bridge. Your torso is pressed up against the medieval stone. Cold, smooth, and flat. Time trapped inside. You press onward to the north side of the bridge. Your shoes are so thin you can feel the transition from flat, laid, smooth boulders to the choppy, uneven cobblestone under your feet. You decide to continue your walk along the river with the Museo Galileo in mind. You double check your map. It's not far. Colorful and vivid buildings shine from across the water. Soft green moss reaches up the walls along the riverbed. You're so charmed by the riverside architecture, you almost walk past the mess of sundial standing in front of your destination. It's a stunning building from the 11th century. The Museo Galileo, housed in the Palazzo Castellani. It shoots six stories up, overlooking the Arno. You crane your neck upwards and feel the sun on your face. Rounded windows and stone arches distinguish the Palazzo. In this museo, Galileo's telescopes are housed as is the framed objective lens which discovered the Galilean moons of Jupiter alongside gorgeous terrestrial and celestial globes. On the first floor, you find Galileo's artifacts. They smell like discovery. You feel a celestial presence. Galileo didn't invent the telescope, but he was the first to use it in a systematic way and that allowed him to observe the bodies in our solar system and record observations. In front of you are two of Galileo's remaining telescopes. You feel small in the universe when you think of the scale of the object these devices uncovered. Made of wood and leather with embellishments of gold, the artifacts are worn, pieces of history. Moments are ingrained in the grain of the wood. The soft, time-worn leather smells of hide and musk. You marvel at what Galileo discovered. The moons of Jupiter, the craters on the surface of our moon, the stars in the Milky Way. Can you imagine what it must have been like to get lost in the velvety darkness of the night sky? To land amongst 
the stars, like Galileo did every time he glanced through his lens. The telescope before you seems ancient, but it launched us into the future. What inspired him? Did the ethereal beauty of the city, the golden sun rising over the river, drive him to search for something more? To search in the darkness for the light? You love the clacking of your shoes, moving around on these ancient floors. You move around rhythmically, mimicking the soothing, stable pace of your morning dream. Sunbeams float through the room, highlighting the golden dusk and light, stressing the dust trapped here in antiquity. You move on. In the third room, you find the armillary sphere. The three-dimensional model used mechanical motion to illustrate theories about our solar system. Made of metal and wood, it was constructed at the request of the Medici and remains today the largest armillary sphere in the world. The rings look wild, but there's a method to the madness. The Earth is placed at the center in keeping with Aristotle and Ptolemy's ideas at the time. The frame and the framework of rings represents latitudes and longitudes in our skies. The wooden pieces are painted in gold leaf and the intricately painted details reveal regions little known at the time of construction in 1588. You step back to admire the sphere, its magnitude, its majesty. You get lost in the astral beauty and the intricacy. It's like the magic and light of the ideas of this place got trapped inside. You almost don't want to leave. You feel compelled to continue examining it, but there's too much more to see. You head towards the exit, leaving the museo feeling inspired. You step out onto the narrow street. The cobblestone energizes you, and your feet make their way quickly now. You pass stores and gelaterias and cafes on your way to the Palazzo Vecchio, the town hall of Florence. You gaze up. The tall clock tower, the Tower of Arnolfo, looms over you. The sharp sun in the sky looms over it. You have to cover your eyes, but the shallow warmth feels good on your face, like your warm cornetto con crema. For seven centuries, the Palazzo Vecchio has been the symbol of civic power in Florence, and you can see why. It's grandiose and immense, standing guard over the city like a sentinel. The Palazzo was built during the 13th and 14th centuries upon the ruins of another Palazzo. The building is cubical and thus easy to defend. It's constructed of solid stone, so it feels close to impenetrable, safe for the Gothic windows. The clock on display here was the first public clock in Florence. It features a single hand, which means the clock always appears to give the wrong time, but in fact is entirely accurate. Just a relic of its time when the single hand was common. You close your eyes. You hear the clock beating in your mind, steady and certain, like the sounds of the train. At the entrance to the palazzo, the statue of David once stood, but now a replica stands in its place. You avoid the tourists gathered around the statues. They are buzzing with laughter and gestures, so you make your way past leaving the loudness of the streets and the piazza behind you. The sound of sneakers padding and heels clacking against stone is now gone. The flutter of pigeons grows faint, now fainter. All that echoes is history in the streets. You continue your journey and 
step into the Cortile di Michelozzo, a courtyard replete with frescoes and stuccos. As you walk through, you hear your footsteps echo against the stone. You glance up and let the beauty wash over you. The painted ceilings, which show depictions of Austrian cities, were a gift to an Austrian bride in the 16th century. What a lush and beautiful welcome that must have been. The columns around the courtyard are cylindrical and octagonal and gilded with plant motives. You reach out to touch a column, let your fingertips follow the intricate grooves. As you make your way through, you're transported into the time of the Medici. The fountain at the center of the courtyard is peaceful, and the water running gives you the feeling that the fountain has always been here, that you've always been here, lost in time. Inside the Palazzo Vecchio, you walk beneath the ceilings painted by Vasari, immense and lively scenes the Italian Renaissance painter left now soar overhead. Inside the woolly silence of the museum, the hushed whispers and soft footsteps gently fill the halls. You're looking for Bronzino, the deposition of Christ. When you find it, you don't expect it to be this big or for the detail to be so true to life. In the painting, Jesus Christ lays across his mother's lap, supported by the Apostle John. Mary Magdalene embraces his feet while cherubs fly overhead. The oil saturates the painting. Vivid hues of orange and blue and pink pop out from the panel. You look closely and see where the oil has cracked, if only slightly. You see the brush strokes in the background. The painting is overwhelming in its sadness and its importance. The piece was originally commissioned for the chapel of Eleonora of Toledo in the Palazzo Vecchio, but was given away as a gift by Eleonora's husband, Grand Duke Cosimo I de Medici. He then commissioned a second copy, which is the one which stands before you today. You take a step back and take the whole picture in. The human bodies huddled close together convey a frenetic energy, but they take great care with the body of Christ as it comes down from the cross. The cherubs in the sky are peaceful and removed, accepting the mad scene below, for they know he will be reborn. You try to imagine how many placid hours Bronzino spent on this piece, how much solitude and love he had to muster. It's hard to imagine that level of dedication. Soon, it's time to take to the streets again. The sun is overhead now. You're hungry, but you decide coffee is what you need to reinvigorate you, to match the energy of this ages old city. Outside the palazzo, you find a cafe on a corner and you walk in. The nutty smell of coffee hits you before you're through the door. You walk past crowded tables and find your way to the bar. You order your coffee at the counter and watch a practiced barista brew your espresso. You sit for a moment at the bar and let yourself relax. The countertop is slick and cold to the touch. Metal edging and a laminate countertop. Your drink arrives almost immediately and the rich, pungent flavor tastes exactly how you imagined an Italian espresso would. You feel your phone vibrate in your pocket and find a text saying that your flat is ready. Lovely, you think. You could use a nap before some dinner and wine. You could stay here all day. You've felt that way about everywhere you've been today, but you have one more stop. 
you set some euros on the counter and say grazie. And you're aware you sound maybe a bit too eager. But the barista nods and smiles at you. And you go on your way. More meandering in Florence is always welcome. So you're almost disappointed when you find you've quickly arrived at the Museo Salvatore Ferragamo. This is the newest of the museums. And by now you could use a break from Renaissance art. You want a break into the future. And what better way to do so than to be inspired by shoe master and artist Salvatore Ferragamo. In front of you is a kaleidoscope. There are exquisite shoes of all colors and shapes. Next to a platform heel that appears to be propped up on rainbow clouds is a red glitter stiletto worn by Marilyn Monroe. Opened in 1995 by the Ferragamo family, the museum contains photographs, sketches, magazines, and wooden lasts of the starlets Ferragamo designed for, including Audrey Hepburn, and Marilyn Monroe. The legendary display of shoes designed by the artist himself is why you're here though. You walk dazed through the splashy rooms of the small basement museum. It's quaint and intimate, but a technicolor dream come to life. You stay here a while, imagining which shoes you take home with you, and which ones you dance in at parties, and which ones would make you a star in a Fellini film. This whole city kind of feels like a Fellini film, come to think of it. When you finally emerge from the museo, you're inspired, and you feel light. And even though you've had a long day, a gorgeous day, strolling Florence through the ages, you know you're only just beginning. You look down the street and see a corner gelateria. Rows of colorful flavors parallel the 